The ancient inhabitants of North America were much more connected than we give them credit for. Many of the items they made and used every day were dependent on a robust trade network to provide the needed materials. It seems the more we learn about the ancient past, the more connected and aware these people become. For example, the Holocom are famous for their beautiful etched shell jewelry. These shells came from hundreds of miles away. Some came from the Gulf of California and others came from the Pacific coast. Residue analysis of cylinder jars has revealed that the ancient inhabitants of Chaco Canyon in northwestern New Mexico were drinking chocolate out of them. Chocolate that had to have been carried over a thousand miles north on the backs of traders. Things like macaw feathers and copper bells, which are found in ruins all over the southwest, attest to the volume of trade that must have come north out of Mexico in those times. The Ancient America's YouTube channel recently published a video about a Native American man who traveled from his home near the Mississippi to both coasts in the late 1600s or early 1700s. I'll link to that video in the doobly-doo in case you're interested. But this story, which may or may not be true, does illustrate just how people in those days could travel long distances and find food and shelter among various language groups. Also, it shows that people in those days were far more aware of the wider world than we tend to give them credit for. For example, people in the middle of the continent knew there was an east and a west coast. Archaeologist Stephen Lexen has written several books about the ancient Southwest. Two of his rules, which he applies when interpreting the past, are 1. Everybody knew everything, which means that people were generally aware of faraway places and events. And 2. Distances can be dealt with, which means that people were not afraid of traveling long distances to trade or stay connected. There are many more examples of trade with faraway places in the Southwest than we can deal with in this video. So let's confine our discussion to trade related to pottery. Let's start with Holcomb Red on Buff Pottery, found all over Southern and Central Arizona where it was made and used from about 500 to 1375 AD. Studies have shown that almost all of it was made in a very small area around the Gila Buttes and traded outward over hundreds of square miles of desert country. One common motif on Holcomb pottery are illustrations of people carrying burden baskets. No doubt this was exactly how the pottery arrived in villages far from the Holcomb Cultural Center, carried in burden baskets on the backs of traders. Perhaps pots like this were meant to reflect the excitement that no doubt followed the arrival of the trader in a village. Not all that different from the way I feel when I see the UPS truck park in front of my house or how people in my grandfather's time felt about the Wells Fargo wagon's arrival. Another example is White Mountain Redware. In the opposite situation from Hoacom Buffware, which was made in one place and traded widely, White Mountain Redware was made across a wide area from western New Mexico into central Arizona. Many of the ingredients for this type of pottery are widely available across this area. Things like gray body clay and yellow ochre paint and white clay slip. However, the black glaze paint is another story. It uses minerals that are not abundant in this area, specifically copper carbonate and lead sulfide. These materials must have been a common item carried in the burden baskets of native traders at that time. I have been interested in these ancient traders for a long time. They seem to leave very little evidence of their passing that archeologists can find. And yet, the evidence of their work is obvious in goods found in villages far from the source of those goods. So we are left to guess what they may have been like, but we do have a pretty good idea how they moved goods around, because burden baskets are often found in ancient caves and were still commonly used by natives in historic times, even for carrying loads of pottery. I have long wanted a good burden basket, so I could see firsthand just what it was like to carry loads of pottery over long distances. Then, in 2019, I was able to trade some pottery for an authentic burden basket made by a survivalist friend of mine. It was, however, just the basket and not the tump line. So my goal today is to try to attach a tump strap to this burden basket so that soon I can do some trading just like those ancient pottery traders.
I think I want to make the cotton strap significantly shorter. More rope, less cotton. So let me cut that down. Now the cotton strap seems to be about the right length. It doesn't go much past my head, just behind my ears. Um, but the rope isn't long enough. Uh, so you can see that the, the pack's riding really high on my back and it should be setting down more in the middle of my back. So uh, what I need is a longer piece of rope. So I'm gonna go down to the hardware store and get a longer length of rope. Whatever cataclysm overtook the Southwest around 1400, no one is exactly sure, but it was most likely a violent uprising and warfare. Much of the Southern Southwest ended up completely abandoned this event cut off centuries-old trade routes between Mexico and the Southwest, so that when the first Europeans arrived, they did not find the same level of trade taking place as had been the case just a couple of generations previously. Perhaps the best insight into the role and importance of traders in the Old Southwest might be gained by looking at the importance of long-distance traders in the Aztec Empire. In the Aztec Empire, long-distance traveling merchants were called Pochteca, and they formed an elite class below the nobility but above the common people. They were known to travel far and wide for trade and carried not only valuable goods but also news from faraway lands. There is no doubt that these Pochteca travelers traveled to what is today the American Southwest. So even if they weren't fully established here, they at least influenced the local traders. Perhaps then the Southwest had had its own merchant class, like the Pochteca at one time. Look at images of ancient Southwestern traders and you will see commonalities across cultural lines. For example, the crooked sticks they all seem to carry. Was this perhaps a symbol of their membership in the elite trading guild? Okay, went to the store, picked up some more rope. It's a little smaller diameter than what I had, but it should work because it says it'll hold up to 39 pounds and I have got two strands, so what's that? Um, something just short of 80 pounds. I'm not hauling no 80 pounds in there. I think I need something like 11 feet of this. I'm just gonna feed it through here. I think that's pretty good. Can't wait to try that out. So if there had been a group of elite traders in the ancient Southwest, why haven't archeologists found evidence of them up to now? I say, perhaps the archeologists have found that evidence, but it hasn't been interpreted correctly. One group of people that might fit the bill is the group I call the Lost Mogollon. They moved from southern Arizona, hundreds of miles north, to the Four Corners area around 700 AD, where they engaged in trade. About 1150, that group moved south to the Cayenta, Arizona area, where they again were heavily involved in trade. 
Finally, about 1275, they moved hundreds of miles south again to southern Arizona, where they were again involved in trade networks. Interestingly, when that cataclysm took place that caused the abandonment of the southern southwest, this group completely disappears from the archaeological record. If you're interested in learning more about these lost mogion, check out this video I made right over here about that. I appreciate you coming with me today. I'll catch you next time. Lila, desist.